blessed is the man with a vision. Hallelujah. Lord, we are grateful for your presence, your love. We're so thankful that you are a good, good father. I pray, Lord, you'd give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to us today as we revisit some very um, foundational material. So help us, Lord. Help us to keep our eyes on you. Thank you for your love. I was thinking about Christmas, of course. It's after Thanksgiving, my mind turns there. And, and uh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Son of Man, came to seek and save the lost. We know this. It says multiple places in Scripture. In Luke, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Aren't we so glad? So glad for that. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Jesus' mission, His purpose was to bring salvation, and I'm great for that. Some of us would argue with Paul, perhaps, in his view, but he says, "...the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost." Some of us would debate with Paul on that, but he wrote it, so he got to say it. And as we enter this season, we tend to think about decorations and, and we give gifts in the name of our Savior. And, and that's good because it reminds us of the ultimate gift that was, paid for, that was paid for us. But the question that I go back to is, we're saved and salvation came, but saved from what? Why? Why did He come? We, we live in a culture that is completely changed from when many of us were growing up. In order to understand what's going on and what we're dealing with, we've got to get back to some basics. God's plan of salvation was not an afterthought. This one sentence here at the end of this where he talks about, the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. God's eternal plan included saving us and salvation. Yeah. So it's not some afterthought. This is, this is from the beginning. A lot of this was triggered, or so, some of this was triggered anyway, and I was sharing this with, uh, with Gabe last week. I read this little book that I got in the mail from Ken Ham, who some of you are probably familiar with, of the Creation Museum and the, the life-size arc thing. And, and he sent this book, and he was talking about the fact that our culture is radically different than it used to be. Specifically, we're living in a culture that is not dominated by Christianity any longer. And it reminded me of a survey, a study that I, that I saw last year. It was kind of a massive Lifeway study. It was in November of 17, and it really shook a lot of the, a lot of the understandings that are out there. While 50% of the people in our country would say they are born again, only 15% of those would agree with these four sentences, which I hope we all would agree with in here. That the Bible is the highest authority for what I believe. It's very important for me personally to encourage non-Christians to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Jesus Christ's death on the cross is the only sacrifice that could remove the penalty of my sin. Only those who trust in Jesus Christ alone as their Savior receive God's free gift of eternal salvation. 15% of people who claim to be born again agreed with that, with those four sentences, which means that we are reaching a culture or trying to reach a culture that we're not even remotely on the same page. And one of the premises that, that I'm basing a lot of this on is that the problem is so many times, and I'm glad a lot of young people are here today, the church teaches Bible stories. And when they get into the government education system, they're taught objective scientific data and facts, supposedly, but that's what they're taught. So in our gatherings, they hear stories. There's veggie tales, right? I'm not knocking these things. It's just the reality that's there. There's stories of Noah and the ark and David and Goliath and Daniel and the lion's den. And, and, and there's, there's puppets and there's cardboard cutouts and all of this kind of stuff that, that the kids are, are saturated with. And all of that is, is fine and good. There's a story of a birth with a baby who comes. The first story they're told is how God created the earth, right? Some old dude holding a globe, checking off. 
States. And then there's two people, Adam and Eve. Those both look the same, though. It's kind of... Anyway, <laughs> and there's an apple and a snake or something or cheese or whatever it was. And <laughs> children by the millions are told the facts. And the facts they're told are is that in the beginning there was eternal dust and that dust was spinning or it exploded or something and then life came out of that which was a single cell and it eventually morphed into more evolved life over billions and billions of years. And we end up where we are today, if you can see that, where we have progressed from, <laughs> you know, you get the idea, you know, we're, we're back to the beginning as we're all looking into our smartphones. If we're going to understand Christmas, we've got to start with Genesis. We've got to figure out what we believe and why we believe it. Because when our kids grow up and they enter into the educational system, the, the, the studies are, are there. They're for everybody to read. 60 to 90 percent of the kids that grow up in a Christian home, in a church that teaches you know, the things that, that are taught through the programs, like I just said, they get to college and they run into people that have degrees and education, and they, they are fed facts at that point. And the Bible stories are fine, but they're stories. And stories are translated into fiction is what it's translated into. And so they, they embrace the facts that are there, a big bang and evolution, and they're taught with technical terms and charts. And they they're, say things like this. You go out and, and look up what they have to say about the things they're, they're going to run into, and it says overwhelming evidence supports this fact. Scientists continue to argue about details of evolution, but the question of whether life has a long history or not was answered in the affirmative at least two centuries ago. Really? Yeah, it was answered you know, 200 years ago. We're not, we're not even debating that. Or, or you get more with Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica. Who's going to argue with Encyclopedia Britannica? I mean, after all, it's an encyclopedia. Can't read, it's too small. Evolutionists no longer are concerned with obtaining evidence to support the fact of evolution, but rather are concerned with what sorts of knowledge can be obtained from different sources of evidence. See, the issue of whether it's true or not is, nah, we're not even there anymore. We're 200 years past that. We're into the truth. And the truth is that this is a fact. And so our young people grow up, and they're fed the stories that are true, and yet when they get to university or college or into the public school system of some sort, the government school system, those stories are mocked and made fun of. Why does it matter? Well, because the Son of the Man came to seek and save those who are lost. But lost from what? What is the problem? And why is it a problem? If we do away with the beginnings, then we miss what the real story is. And the real story is that in the beginning, when a choice was made to disobey God, sin and death were unleashed. <laughs> That's the real story. That's the beginning of the problems. And if we forget that, and believe me, our culture does not understand this in any way, shape, or form. It's anti-Christ. It is anti-Bible. It is anti-Scripture. Fifteen percent of the people who claim to be born again even believe that the Scripture is the highest authority of their life. That means, I'm not a math major, but I think that means about 85 percent of them do not. Which means it is a polluted mess of some sort that is out there. <laughs> it makes a difference. This is true or not. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. If evolution has to be integrated into the scripture, and I guarantee you that there are seminaries all across this country, there are, there are pastors and teachers and professors that are embarrassed by the first few pages of Genesis. And they work overtime to explain it and get rid of it. I've got a real serious problem with that. Yeah. Because if you do that, what are you doing to the rest of the book? What are you doing to Romans 5? What are you doing to the ultimate problem? <laughs> you undermine Christmas when you do away with creation and Genesis. If Adam and Eve didn't sin, what's the point of Jesus Christ coming as a baby? The darkness has been very effective in trying to pollute the message of the light. 
We have to figure out a way to match the evolutionary principles. Did you see the headline in Fox News yesterday on their website, by the way, about how some scientists have had these major breakthroughs where they've discovered that all of human life, and particularly hu human life, traces back to two people? <laughs> You're going, wow, really? That, I mean, you know, they had to work in hundreds of thousands of years or whatever, but apparently something happened that killed everybody else because we know they were there, and these two people survived somehow. And all of life came from that. And I'm going, well, you're getting closer <laughs> to the reality. But the problem is when you undermine a literal creation and a literal Adam and Eve, you get to the root issue of doing away with sin. You must. Because this is where it started. Right? right? And if there is no sin, then what do you need a Savior for? Oh, maybe we're getting somewhere into the enemy's plans. Let's pollute it and get rid of it because after all, sin's not that big of a deal. If Adam and Eve is simply a story, then this means nothing. I will put enmity between you and the women, woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. If it's just a little bit of literary concept that's thrown in there and not the truth, then it doesn't really matter what goes on in our world. And it doesn't really matter what goes on. Why did Jesus come to crush the head of the serpent if it's just a little picture that they use that has no validity? Many people with lots of degrees after their initials, after their name, discount the opening pages of the book of Genesis because they're embarrassed. They don't believe it. And so they come up with stuff. But, but my question to them is that, okay, if we do away with Adam and Eve, and they're not real people, they're types, they're figureheads, they're just a story that was used after all, it's everywhere and all the different people groups have it. If we do away with that, well, then what about Cain and Abel? We have to do away with them. Because you can't have real children of fictitious people. And what about Seth that you trace the bloodline of Christ back to? Well, we have to get rid of him too, don't we? I mean, where do you draw the line then? If you start whacking out the parts of the scripture that you don't like, where do you draw the line? Who gets to make that determination? I've mentioned it before, there's a big church in our city where the pastor is pro-homosexuality. He says, those, those verses are simply bucket scriptures. And I'm going, what? What do you mean they're bucket scriptures? Well, you just put them in there, and then you don't have to deal with them, and you decide they don't apply anymore. And I'm going, well, who has the bucket? Who's got the filter? Who's got the key to it? Who determines what's right or wrong, and which one goes in that bucket? I didn't get the bucket. I got the book. How do I go through and say, okay, these, these don't apply anymore? And that's what guys are doing with Genesis and creation. And <laughs> creation's everywhere throughout the scripture. You read through the scripture, you're going to run into it with credible people talking about it, including Jesus. And so if we do away with it, we've got some serious issues in our day, and yet that is exactly what has happened. And, of course, we have to get rid of Noah because Noah would be a myth. Whereas the flood can answer most of the questions that are tied into evolution, and yet we have to do away with that because it doesn't fit with what we think science has taught us. See, we're told not to be ignorant of the schemes of the enemy so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we're not to be ignorant of his schemes. One of the schemes that he's very successful with is capturing the next generation of young people coming up. They're, they're told stories in church, and then they get the facts from people who have credibility when they're educated. And we wonder why there's a crisis of faith. And, and I'm not down on the stories. I hope you hear me properly. What we're, what we're trying to do is figure out how to ground our young people in the truth of God's word to believe it and know that they believe it. And when they go out and face those things, they have an answer for it. Prayer and teachings of the scripture have been removed from the government system of school, unless you're mocking and making fun of it. So we're dealing with a culture that, that you go to them and say, you need Jesus. And they're going, who? 
or why? What do I care? He's just like Santa Claus. He's just another something that was made up. Our schools are so smart, and our government is so smart, they can't figure out there's a difference between boys and girls. Really? The Christmas reality has its roots in the garden. And if we lose that, which I'm guaranteeing you, we have lost it, (laughs) then what's the point of the birth of Christ? It doesn't matter. The Savior came to defeat the works of the enemy with sin and death unleashed. What are those? It doesn't matter. There isn't any of that stuff. That was all just made up. Many blame God for the condition of this world. You get into a discussion with somebody who's an atheist or, or an agnostic or somebody who's had a deep loss in their life, what's the first question they say? How could a God of love let this happen? You take Genesis out of the picture, where'd this stuff come from? came from sin and death being unleashed. You get to Romans 8. Verse 18, start there, says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revelation or the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. If you do away with sin which you must, if there is no literal creation, if there is no actual Adam and Eve, then what is sin? You must get rid of it. (laughs) Then, to do it the other way, if we believe what the Scripture teaches, that there there was a literal creation where God spoke and it was, and there were literal people, Adam and Eve, and they were given a command and they disobeyed it, and God said the punishment of that is sin and death. If we believe that, then I can talk to somebody today and say, you know why the world is a mess that it's in? It's because of the sin and death that was unleashed in the garden. Do you know why we celebrate Christmas? It's because a Savior needed to be born. That baby needed to come (laughs) because we're sin and death and it dominates everything. And it isn't that God didn't love us. The amazing thing is that there's anything good in this world. It isn't that there's evil in this world. If we're simply an evolved hunk of slime that crawled out of a cell that climbed down on the back of a crystal out of a pool of slime, they say, I got faith. You know, that, and that's what we've evolved into. Then the amazing thing is that there's anything good at all. We're just highly developed animals. Really, animals eat their young, right? I mean, they they eat the weak. It's only the strong survive. Then why do we have hospitals? Why do we have anything good in this world? Why does anybody stop for somebody in the road instead of just running them over? Why? 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 Well, there's something else. Angry, hurt people blame God. God sent his son to die for the choice that Adam and Eve made. Now, it's not hopeless. (laughs) And I'm so grateful for this promise as Jesus was talking to Peter and he said, you're Peter, you got this confession right. And on that rock, that, that confession that you gave, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's not gonna win. Jesus isn't going to lose. He's already got the victory. Yeah, but look at the world, and look at all the problems, and look at the kids walking over, and look at everything, nobody believes anything. The church is going to be okay. Jesus Christ is going to build his church. There is a kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is going to be established. I got it on good authority. It's our job to go out and make sure that the next generation understands what is reality and what is truth. You all that have children in here, which is most everybody who goes to this church, we've got to understand what the false teachings are that are being shoved down our children's philosophical throat. 
in every presentation that's made. Entertainment, music, news, culture, academia. There is a prejudice and a bias against the things of God. It's just there. And when science comes along and supposedly says something, it, it, it's a theory, and yet they adopt it, they mock and ridicule what the Scripture says. How are your kids going to stand up against that? How are, how are they going to deal with it? 60 to 90% of the kids don't do very well with it, statistically speaking. They walk away from their faith in their first year of college. Why is that? Because they're not ready. They're not grounded in the Word of God. They've been raised on, you know, veggie tale stories, and then they run into some guy who's got a bunch of initials after his name who says that's bogus and here's why, and they don't have an answer for it. And they're going, wow, this guy's really smart, and he's very authoritative, and he's saying it like, yeah, this makes sense. What I believe maybe isn't so good. After all, it was just a story. I'm not knocking stories. What I'm saying is we need to know the truth. Jesus said to the Jews who were believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We must know the truth of God's word. And getting rid of the early pages of Genesis because we don't like it or it doesn't mesh with what the world's screaming or because they mock and ridicule anybody who believes it is not the answer. It just isn't. Christmas out of context means very little other than decorations, good food, music that starts too early for some people. Christmas is about the birth of a Savior who came to seek and save the lost because Adam made a choice to sin and unleash death. That's why he came. That's what Christmas is about. And if we miss that, we're missing the point. Jesus Christ came and broke the curse of sin. If we do away with sin in its beginning, what's he breaking? What did he break on the cross? What did he deal with? You see how it's tied together? It, it is a direct link. And so many times we don't even think about it. We've got to begin with the beginning or our ending is going to be messed up. And I guarantee you that's where we are. You go through those four principles that everybody in here would say, well, yeah, 15% of the people believe it. Most don't. You get outside of those who claim to be born again. They don't even know what you're talking about. We are offering them the cure, and they're going, I'm not even sick. I have no disease. That's your opinion. That's just simply your view. I'm glad that works for you. That doesn't mean a thing to me. And we've lost track of the disease, which is sin and death. We've, we've made it non-existence. I'm not a builder or a son of a builder, but I know enough to know that if your foundation is wrong or crooked or not secure or not stable, your building is not going to stand. And it certainly isn't going to be straight. And it isn't going to be solid. I've built lots of things like that. You get the foundation wrong, it doesn't work. The foundation for Christmas is Genesis. The truth of God's Word. So I'm going to ask you some questions, and I'm going to ask you some more questions. Do you believe, you, you, each one of you here, do you believe in the early pages of Genesis? Do you believe that God spoke and created? Do you believe there was an actual Adam and Eve? Do you believe that? And if not, why not? What happened? Where did, you, where did it go? And again, it, it, you can't just lop off the parts you don't like. Well, I don't like that, so I'm, I'm going I'm to start believing in chapter 5. Okay, well, that's what a lot of people do, and you're going, well, why 5? Why not 7? Or let's just forget Genesis. Let's, I like Psalms. Let's start there. Who cares about all that other stuff? Where, where do we draw the line? How do you answer the evolution theory? Surely I'm not the only one who encounters people that are adamant about it, who mock and ridicule creation, mock and ridicule Adam and Eve, who mock and ridicule the early pages of the Scripture. Right, what do you do with it? How do you deal with it? Are you prepared to deal with it? It should be. It's, it's foundational. We should know these things. We should at least understand what we believe or why we believe it, shouldn't we? 
particularly this time of the year. What a great conversation around a dinner table with your unsaved relatives. Let's talk about Christmas this year. Let's start with Adam and Eve. Huh? You got them already. You got a great hook, right? <laughs> what, are you nuts? No. Are you preparing your young people to face some questions that they are going to face? We're about generational impact here. Well, part of that is making sure that when your young people step out into the world, they can answer some questions. And here's some basic ones. How can you possibly believe Genesis in the face of all the overwhelming evidence against it? That's a good question to talk through. How can you possibly believe that, Click? How can you believe that with all the facts of science? Well, let's step back and talk about what science is and how it's defined. What is the definition of science? It's discovering, you know, what is there. It's being able to test what has been said to have occurred. Science is discovery. What you believe in evolution is a religion. It is a faith statement. You have no more ability to prove that, that the eternal dust exploded and spun off life than I do saying, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. We're both in a faith position. My faith just makes a whole lot more sense than yours. And just because you add billions of years to it does not make a hoot of difference. I've never found anything that gets significantly better after a hundred years, let alone a billion years. I threw in the 100 because I know people talk about wine and stuff, and I don't know that much about wine, but it's for your sake because they say, well, yeah, well, wine gets better with age. Okay, a thousand-year-old bottle of wine, I'm assuming, is undrinkable. I don't know. I don't know anything about wine. Let's forget wine. <laughs> Everything deteriorates. It just does. It doesn't get better. It just falls apart. If God is love... And all-powerful, why is there so much evil in the world? I guarantee you, you will get that question. If you venture outside of your home, if you talk to anybody about the Lord, you're going to get some derivative of this question. How do you answer that? You need to have an answer for that. <laughs> As parents, you need to have an answer for your kids. You send them off to school, you send them off to drama group, you send them off to a music group, you send them off to a concert, you send them off anywhere, a mission trip or whatever, and they come back and ask this question. You need to have an answer for them, don't you? Shouldn't you? Shouldn't I be able to answer this question? Because I guarantee you, you'll run into it. Are we preparing our young people for it? Hey, I'm as good as the next guy and probably a little bit better. What's the problem? <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, I've done some bad things, but man, do you know? Look at this guy. He makes me look like a saint. And you mean... God's going to evaluate me and not take into consideration him? Give me a break. How are you going to answer that? How are you gonna, I mean, you're going to run into that, aren't you? <laughs> Come on, we are. Stop judging me. <laughs> Threw that one in just for fun. Not really a question, but that's the standard answer for anything when you start getting close to the truth of God's word. Well, you just think you're better than I am. Frankly, I'm not thinking about you at all. I'm thinking about the word of God. <laughs> My comparison to you is irrelevant it's just a way to throw the argument away. You know, the, the, the scripture says this is wrong. Quit judging me. <laughs> okay. I'll let the word of God judge you. Shouldn't we, as parents and as people, have answers to these questions? Part of the answer, what's Christmas all about? Christmas is all about Genesis 3. <laughs> it starts there. And it's worked its way out until where we are, where we needed, desperately needed the birth of a Savior. I was looking for a picture of Santa Claus and the, the, the manger side by side, and I didn't find one because that's kind of where we are in this world. It doesn't really matter whether you have Santa or the manger. They're both stories. Yeah, it makes a hoot of difference. It makes a lot of difference. Hoot isn't the right word. It makes a lot of difference. Because Jesus Christ came to seek and save those who are lost. All right. Lord, thank you so much for your word. I pray we would be people of your word, students of your word, whatever our age is in here. 
that we would anchor our life in your word, our truth, our understanding, Lord, that your word is either true or it isn't. (laughs) And I pray that we would study these things out and find out what we believe and why we believe it, and that we would help those under our realm of influence to do the same. We would challenge them, encourage them to understand what it is they believe and why. God, I thank you. There is salvation in no other name than Jesus Christ, that you loved us so much. You sent your son into this world not to judge and condemn, but to save us. There is a time of judgment coming, and there is a time of condemnation. But you sent your son as that baby to undo the works of the enemy, the curse of the sin. And I'm so grateful for that, that we can know you in a deep, personal, intimate way. Thank you for life. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the truth. God, I thank you that we can trust you. No matter what comes our way, you are a good, good father. And you rule and you reign. And you have all authority. That you are going to build your church. And the gates of hell will not overcome it. And that when we know you, we are born again. And we live the rest of our days walking with you, learning and growing in you. You've left us here to be a light and an influence. And I thank you for that privilege. May we take advantage of it. Lord, thank you for today. And I pray you would protect people as they drive home. They'd use wisdom and there'd be safety. Lord, we could ponder these things as we go throughout our week and on into this season. Thank you so much for it. I give you praise. Amen.